before we get into the final act for this one, I would like to mention that the latest patch wasn't the best thing to happen to my save file. While I did manage to get the game running, it was rather unstable. Oh well, that's what I get for taking way too long to finish a run. Unfortunately, I also encountered some bugs due to this. Luckily, most of them happened in unimportant parts, though there was a somewhat major part where it did affect me, but we will get there when the time comes. Alright, let's bring death to this world. But before we can go to Borner's Gate, we need to take care of Orpheus Honor Guard. And as you all know, there's only one way how to properly deal with them. With Orpheus Honor Guard dead, we subdue him once more and leave him in the care of our Dream Guardian. Who, by the way, is a Mind Flayer. Who could have guessed? Anyway, with these unpleasanties out of the way, we can now proceed to Border's Gate. Our first stop there is Fek Droger, a Sharon trader who sells us the Hellrider Longbow, which gives us a plus 3 on our initiative. Next, we make our way to the Circus, where we are going to acquire our last two items for this area. But before we come to that, we need to kill a clown live on stage, as you do. A bloodthirsty rush of fury engulfs you. You want to butcher the crowd, women and children alike, and soak in their innards. It is glorious. To make this fight a little easier, we take out these two beforehand. By jamming the cage shot for the little kitten and tossing some meat for the big boy. Now we eagerly watch how a circus visitor gets murdered on stage. Before we start with our own killing. And you didn't saw that. And this was definitely the only time this ever happened. After some successful place poison clouds, we managed to take out all the doppelgangers without bigger problems. At level 10, we get the Inure to Undeath ability which prevents us from having our hit point maximum reduced and gives us resistance to necrotic damage. For our extra cantrip we choose poison spray simply because it's the most fitting cantrip for a necromancer. For our spells we don't unlock anything new that would be interesting for us, so I just chose remove curse which we actually need later on to remove some curses. And for the second spell I went with greater invisibility because this spell is simply broken and who knows, it might become handy later on. To acquire the item we want, we need to kill Lucretius, the owner of this circus. To do that, we use Mana Illusion to lure her to a place where we can kill her without any interference. Once you killed her, she will drop two items. The first item being the Spellmite Claws, which can increase the damage of your spells that require an attack roll by 1d8 if you choose to add a minus 5 penalty to the attack wall. To get this item you actually don't need to kill her, you can either get this item to steal it or by simply doing her quest. But this doesn't apply to the second item we get from killing her, which is also the main reason why we killed her. The hollow stuff is an item that you can steal from her or acquire to any other means. Though, to be fair, command drop weapon should also work in theory but I didn't have the spell and also never tried it, so I can't say for sure. Anyway, the reason I wanted this stuff so badly is because it has the heightened necromancy ability. This ability gives creatures disadvantage on saving throws against our necromancy spells, making them even deadlier. And especially combined with our high spell safety C, we are looking at 90% plus success chances for our necromancy spells while the enemies also have disadvantage on their saving throws. Making it basically impossible for normal enemies to succeed a saving throw against us. And this also goes for most boss enemies, as you will later see. Now all that's left to do for us is to acquire the 5000 gold to buy the stone statue to get the perma blessing. 
which we used to have until I bought a bow for almost 5000 gold. Yeah, I know that the prices from traders got more expensive in honor mode, but now that I think about it, 5000 gold for an uncommon bow seems a bit over the top, doesn't it? Anyway, all we have to do is to turn into a loot goblin for a bit and finish some quests. With this it should be no trouble at all to get the 5000 gold. For she who fights with monsters should look to it that she herself becomes a monster. Child of Baal? How fun! I always wondered how it would feel to kill your own siblings. And now it's my right to do it. This is... Greater than you could have dreamed. Today is a wonderful day for murder. We finish our quests in this cave, which puts our gold just over the needed 5000. So it's time to head to the circus and... Yeah, it's gone. I forgot that since I didn't accept Lucrezio's quest and even killed her, there is no reason for the circus to stay in Baldur's Gate. Oh well, we didn't really need the permablast anyway, so it's fine. Now before we go and see Gortosh, we make one last quick trip to the beach. There we will help the guild kill some tux from the stone lord, so we can later just walk past the guards in front of their hideout. Upon meeting Gortosh, he tells us about our past and that we were the mastermind behind the Absolute until Orwin absorbed our rightful place as Bald Chosen. He then sweet talks ab I mean, we decide on our own accords to renew our alliance with him and let him go through with his coronation. Enver Gortash, the council appoints you Archduke of Baldur's Gate. Our first stop in the lower city is Ramazet's tower. There we meet the sorry excuse of a wizard named Lororican, who is just another nutcase seeking immortality to Dame Aelin. I'm going to enjoy cutting his life short with our good friend. But before we get to that, we are going to do a little heist in this tower. We jump down one floor, there you will find five pillars. Three of them will activate security measures trying to kill you, while the other two are teleporters. First we are looking for the teleporter that teleports us below. There we find two items protected by two globes of invulnerability. To get these items you need to reveal the two invisible levers in front of them and pass a 20 arcana check on each of them. The first item we get from here is the Marcos Kia stuff. This stuff gives us a plus one on both our spell save DC and spell attack rolls. Additionally, it gives us the arcane battery ability, allowing us to cast a spell of any level without spending a spell slot once per long rest. And last but not least, we also get the quest cast favor spell. This spell imbues you with an element of your choice, giving you resistance to that element and lets you deal additional damage of chosen element equal to your proficiency bonus. On top of that you also get two spells of the chosen element to cast once per short rest. In our case 90% of the time we are going to use the poison version of the extra poison damage and for the free poison cloud that comes with it. The second item we get is the rope of the weave which also gives us a plus one to our spell safety C and spell attack rolls. Additionally, it increases our armor class by two and lets us heal one to six HP whenever we succeed a saving throw against a spell. Next, we go to the pillar that teleports us into the vault. Inside the vault, you will immediately find the Red Knight's final stratagem right behind you. Upon reading this book, you will get the scroll of Artistry of War which essentially is just a higher level version of magic missile that you can cast once per short rest. This is a unique scroll that you can only acquire by reading this book, which is also why you want to learn this spell from this scroll, as this is the only way how you can acquire this spell. Just as a small side note, at the next room on the left side is a small hidden room with a genie lamp. If you interact with the lamp, you will swap places with the genie inside, trapping you 
inside the lamp. But you can simply bypass this by moving the lamp with the summon, which then will swap your summon with the genie. The genie will then reward you for your genius with some gold. Summon? Curse us, wretched head. Why did I not think of that? Such ingenuity should be rewarded. Yeah, good tidings upon you. And this is how it looks inside the lamp. There is a bunch of loot lying around. But since we are summoned, we can't take any of it. Though I think there was also a way how you can escape the lamp if you happen to trap yourself in it. But I can't remember how. Now we get to the main part of the vault. Usually, you would need to solve a puzzle to open the two vault doors. But I'm way too lazy for that. So once more, knock will solve all my problems. Inside the vault of castles is the Annals of Castles book. And upon reading it, we get a scroll of the throne, which is another unique scroll. It's not as unique as the Art of War scroll door, since some traders also have the chance to sell you the scroll from time to time. But it's still unique in a way, since the only way how you can acquire the spell is by learning it from a scroll. So this is exactly what we are going to do here again. And last but not least, we go onto the Vault of Elminster. There we find the whatever codex. Upon reading this book you will get cursed, which you then can simply remove with the remove curse spell. Once we remove the curse we get the whatever vigor ability. This ability will give us a 20 HP temporary buff after every long rest. Now we can finish reading the necromancy of Tay. You still need to pass one last wisdom check of 20 door, so be prepared for that. Upon completing the Necromancy of Tay, you get the Danse Makwaba spell. This spell lets you summon up to 5 simple AI controlled ghouls. They are not very strong, but they have one very interesting hidden ability. And this is that they explode on death, dealing necrotic damage. And this is something that will become very handy later on, as you will see. Before we start doing any fighting in the lower city door, there are still two items that I want to buy. First one being the Cloak of the Weave from Helsig. This cloak also has the Arcane Enchantment ability, giving us a plus one to our spell safety C and spell attack words. And last but not least, we knock on the door of our necromancer friend Mystic Carrion, who will sell us the Hood of the Weave, which also has the Arcane Enchantment ability. But this time we get a plus 2 on our spell safety C and attack walls instead of the usual plus 1. He also gives us a quest to hunt down one of his runaway undead servants. Pretty pathetic for a necromancer if you ask me. Losing control of your own servants couldn't happen to me. I only ever lose control of myself, which is way more professional. And with that, it's finally time for a new ruler for Ramazut's tower. Who, you ask? Well, me, of course. For the fight against Loorken, it's very important that you start the fight while you are invisible. This is because when the fight starts, you and all your summons will spawn very close together. And if you remember what the AI-controlled ghouls do when they die, yeah, that would result into a very unpleasant death. When fighting Loroiken, you never want to attack him directly with your main character, as long as his Myrmidons are still alive. This is because he gets the Elemental Retort ability from them. This ability essentially lets him do a magic missile reaction on anyone that attacked him, dealing 3d8 elemental damage with each missile for each Myrmidon that is still alive. To put it short, this ability can easily one-shot you and on top of that, he can use this an infinite amount of times per turn, since this reaction doesn't use his reaction point. So you are basically forced to kill all his Myrmidons before you start dealing with him. Unless you stun him. I mean, our ghouls have the Paralyze ability on their claw attacks, so why not try and... I mean, they won't be able to do much against the Myrmidons anyway, so... Okay, when can I expect the exposed video? 
Anyway, we use our skill RNG to kill Lorican with our new Art of War spell. Or we don't. Oh well, because I didn't want to waste another attack on Lorican to finally kill him, I decided to finish him off using the AoE Necromancy spell Circle of Death by using a scroll, since this is a tier 6 necromancy spell that I don't have yet. Now that Lorican is dead, we want to focus our attacks on the second most dangerous enemy in this fight, the Water Myrmidon. The Water Myrmidon is so dangerous because he has a ranged multi-attack, which also can easily one-shot you if he crits. So we hit it with our detoned spell, removing a good chunk of its hit points. For the remaining fight, we just hide behind our summons and Aelin, while they take them out one by one, mainly to the help of our explosive friends. You are broken by its beauty. Next, we are going to kill Mystic Carrion. To do that, we first need to find Trombo. You can find Trombo inside this house, hiding inside the closet. Usually to kill Mr. Carrion, you need to follow an entire questline to find and then destroy his heart. But you also can just skip everything, kill Trombo and loot it from its corpse. And be sure to stay at a safe distance when destroying his heart. It's quite explosive. Fighting against Mr. Carrion is a bit of a pain, since he summons a bunch of mummies once the fight starts. Mummies are one of the strongest undead summons, and to my misfortune, they also are immune to both poison and aquatic damage, which is our main damage source. The same also goes for Mystic Carrion. So the only way for us to damage him is using the force damage from our Art of the War spell and Disintegrate Scrolls. Which, to be fair, are two of the strongest spells in this game. Unfortunately, this is still not enough to kill him in one turn. And since he also has immunity to all physical damage types, my summons can't finish him. Which is annoying to say the least, as Mystic Carrion has a reaction that allows him to turn any undead creature that makes an attack. And similar to Lorican's special reaction, he also can use this an infinite amount of times. Good that I always have my backup bombs for situations like this. But now I'm forced to retreat, because I have no way of killing all these mummies. So I do just that and then put the asset arrow into my spell selection once more so that I have a damage source that I can use against them. While fighting the mummies I just used everyone's favorite hit and run tactic until they were all dead. Upon defeating Mr. Carrion we get the most important item for our build, the Staff of Sheriff's Necromancy. Like the Hollow Stuff, this stuff also has the Heightened Necromancy ability, but on top of that it also has another ability. The Life Essence Service ability allows you to cast any Necromancy spell for free and you even can do a max level up cast of it after you killed an enemy. You can use this ability once every turn and if you don't use it, the Absorbed Life Essence will last until your next long rest. Sounds broken? And it is. Combined with the Arcane Battery ability from the Marcus Kier stuff, you can now cast 3 level 6 spells in one turn. And even after that you can cast one level 6 necromancy spell every turn, assuming you can get a kill to trigger the ability. At level 11 we unlock our level 6 spell slot and therefore also our level 6 spells. The first spell we want to pick here is Create Undead. This spell now also allows us to summon mummies, the same ones you saw in the fight against Mystic Carrion. The other two spells we want are Disintegrate and Circle of Death, both spells that we already used in some of our fights via Squalls. The Circle of Death being a very interesting spell in our case. First of all because it's a Necromancy spell, which means that we can spam this spell by using our Life Essence Harvest ability. 
and secondly because it's an AoE spell that covers a very large area and damages every creature within, which allows us to do some very fun interactions with our exploding ghouls. Now it's time to make our way to the guild's hideout and pay Nine Fingers a visit. To her, we find out more about the Stone Lord and her assassination plan against him at the Counting House. So naturally we go there. Our assassinations are always fun, no chance I'm going to miss that. Once we are at the Counting House, be sure to use the Invisibility and the Elixir of Vigilance before you enter the main board so that you can see Bolt's assassins at all times and get the first move against them. The fight itself is very straightforward, since most of our spells are saving throw spells, Sanctuary is useless against us, which allows us to easily take them out one by one. Unfortunately the Stone Lord fled the scene and we have to track him down in the sewers. Killing all the ballast, including war isn't a problem anymore, now that we have all our endgame spells. We just need to be a bit careful we don't accidentally kill Minsk with our AoE attacks. This wretch has stood against your father before. You tremble to end him. Every part of your rancorous body yearns for it. Oh, and we will. We definitely will. But not now. Not here. A hero like him deserves a more thrilling finale. Now that we know about the plan of the Zentrian to overthrow the guild, we head there to help out Nine Fingers. Well, not like that she needs us. She unironically could almost solo all of the Zentriums. And with her guards, the Zentriums don't stand a chance. But you know, attendance is also important. This way we at least can pretend like we did something. After we killed all the Zentriums, we can loot the blast from them holding the Spectator. Which I could have sworn I already took in Act 1. But apparently not. Oh well, now we have it. Having finished that quest, it's finally time to go boss hunting. Starting with Kazador, we first have to take care of his guards. Yeah, don't worry, I remembered. Not happening again. Taking out all of Kazador's guards gives us enough XP to reach our final level. At level 12, the only interesting thing for us is the third feat, since we already have all the spells we want and need. For our last and final feat, we take Alert. Usually, you will very rarely see me take this feat, because I prefer taking feats that increase my damage output. But in this instance, we already maxed out our damage output, which makes Alert the most useful pick. With this feat, we are now basically guaranteed to go first in every single fight, which indirectly also increases our survivability. Now we come to the part I already mentioned in the intro. The fight against Kazador was completely messed up, as Kazador unfortunately was bugged. First of all, he didn't even have his legendary action, which already makes this fight kinda boring. But that's not all, he also was immune to all types of physical damage, even though he only is supposed to be resistant to them. As you can see here, even the visuals are bugged out. It says that he only has resistance, but shows the symbol for immunity. And that's also how the game would treat this, as I wasn't able to deal any physical damage to him. Anyway, let's just skip the shit show and proceed to the best part of the questline. With the Vampire Lord gone, it's time to pay a visit to our stalker Raphael. Let's see how he likes it if someone enters your home uninvited. Inside Raphael's house, we are immediately greeted by a woman who's crazy. Why is everyone crazy here? 
Seriously, am I the only normal one in this world? Oh well. We take the normal way into a stranger's bedroom over the balcony, where we have a civilized conversation with Raphael's personal incubus, who tells us how to get Raphael's mightiest, I mean the awful hammer. Upon taking the awful hammer, we trigger Raphael's security measures, which we bravely fought off. Before we start the fight against Raphael, we equip the Amulet of Greater Health. This amulet will help us to tank his attacks and to remain our concentration spells. Now, preparing for the fight, we summon our explosive ghouls very close together and then immediately ungroup them, so they will stay there. We then use the Quesca's Favor spell to gain fire protection, lasting throughout the entire fight. Followed up by an elixir of battle mage's power to increase our spell safety C. And last but not least we use invisibility potions to turn our ghouls and also ourselves invisible after we cast a taste on ourselves. Once all the enemies spawned, after we roasted Raphael. You contemptuous creature! We use mana illusion to gather everyone around our ghouls. Once we achieve that, we pause the game and drink an elixir of bloodlust. This won't override the effect from the elixir of battle mage's power, as the buff from this elixir is also turn based. All we lose is the automatic refill of the turn based duration. To start the fight we use a disintegrate spell on Yugia. This is because he is the only enemy who won't get surprised and therefore I would prefer to kill him immediately in the first round. With the start of the fight, we drink a flying potion to increase our mobility. This might be not so important now, but it will be later on. Now we use a circle of death scroll to deal damage to everyone, including our ghouls, which will cause them to explode, dealing additional necrotic damage to everyone around them. Through our kill on Koala, we triggered our blood elixir and our life essence ability, which now allows us to cast another circle of death for free. Well, that's not good. Let's hope he doesn't do anything too drastic. Alright, that's okay. We don't really care about the poison anyway, since it doesn't affect our saving for spells. On our second turn, we use our second and last circle of death scroll to finally kill Yugia and the remaining champions. Which again will trigger both our Bloodlust Elixir and Life Essence ability. Now I intentionally chose not to counterspell Raphael's Rebuke, because I'm dealing Radiant damage to the Kalos Glowing. And this allows him to cast Punish Divinity on me every time after he healed himself. And this is very dangerous for me, as this reaction can potentially stun me. Infernal Stun, to be exact. Which is a stun that lasts for 4 turns. So, if he hits you with this, you're just dead. No chance you can survive 4 turns alone. So, I want to save all my counter spells for this reaction. Alright, back to the fight, there is still one champion that survived. But this is not really a problem, as I can just use another circle of death to deal damage to both him and Raphael. With everyone dead but Raphael, the elixir of blood loss doesn't have any use for me anymore. So I replace it with an elixir of battle mage's power to increase my spell safety C by 3 once more. Now we are the gold, but that doesn't matter since we are mostly going to use saving throw spells against Raphael anyway and these spells don't count as directly targeting someone. You, play with you saw that? Counter spell didn't work. Yet another issue I had in this game, that counterspell was just not working properly from time to time. Which is very dangerous as this can easily kill me in this particular fight. Well, let's just hope this won't happen. For our next action point in this round, we are actually not going to attack Raphael, but instead summon everyone's favorite spectator. And this is also why it's so important for us to have a very high mobility so the spectator won't focus his attacks on us. 
Now that we aren't beguiled anymore, we can use our Art of War spell on Raphael, which unfortunately ended in us becoming beguiled again. But that's okay. After all, Raphael was the time to summon an Eternal Debtor to fuel our Life Essence ability. This Life Essence allows us to cast a max level up cost of Blight on him at the next turn. Which he unfortunately saved against, but we still got a good damage roll out of it. On the next turn we just keep hitting him with our blight spells. Also, I'm drinking a speed potion here, even though I don't need to, because of potential healing issues. Raphael deals a lot of damage and I'm full life now, so I can drink a speed potion without any issues. And I would like to always heal myself when I take damage to avoid having low HP at any point. Once again, Raphael is kind enough to summon an internal adapter next to us to fuel our life essence ability. There, you saw? This time counter spell worked, even though there was a massive lag between, but it still worked. Weird stuff. Now it's time to finally use our arcane battery ability to cast Disintegrate on Raphael. It's only a 56% chance, but I thought I won't be able to kill Raphael without a reset if I don't take this risk. So I did, and luckily it worked out for me this time. For my next attack I decided to hit Raphael with Bone Chill to prevent him from healing. This way we can hit him with our last two remaining Blight spells and then hopefully finish him off with the Dethrone spells. But this also means that he will beguile us again. So we have to wait two turns before we can attack him with Dethrone. Because even though Dethrone is a saving throw spell that can't miss, attacking someone with it still counts as directly targeting the enemy for some reason. The problem with this is that Raphael now has two turns where he can heal up again and we can damage him without risking to become the gold again. But that's not entirely true. As you know, I always have my backup bombs prepared for any situation. But we are still not in the best situation right now as we need to refill our speed potion this turn. But we also preferably need to heal this turn to avoid getting to low HP. But that's exactly why I still carry the Darth Meat from the first act around. Because as Dark Urge I can heal myself with this meat without using an action or bonus action point. So now we can heal ourselves and refill our speed potion. And with only 80 hit points left, it should be no trouble at all to finish Raphael with our two Dethrone spells, even if he succeeds both saving throws. Unless of course we have such a massive low roll. Never worried. Clearly, it was obvious he failed the second saving throw. No more devils. No more debts. With its master gone, the house is nothing more now than an empty carcass. Now, before we continue, I need to go get an item that I should have gotten a long time ago. The amulet of the devout gives us the high spellcasting ability which increases our spell safety C by 2. Upon looting the amulet from the chest, you will get cursed, which you then can simply remove with remove curse. 
However, this will summon a hostile diva that you need to kill. You could also just long rest to remove this curse, but if you do that, you have to fight two divas the next morning. Alright, with that, it's finally time to pay our dear sister a visit. But first, we need to take a bath. After all, we need to look presentable at our family reunion. In front of Baal's temple awaits yet another trial for us. And you better believe I totally did this trial the intended way. Inside Baal's temple we meet our dear sister Owen, playing with her food again. In the end, we even had to push her to finish the job. Never have I seen someone more unworthy of Bard's blessing. At least she created a beautiful corpse. I'm gonna preserve her well. Anyway, it's time to get rid of that child and reclaim what is rightfully ours. The changeling stands no chance, fetish one. Eviscerator. And he's right. The one you run against Orwan as Dark Urge is the easiest boss fight in the game. Simply impossible to lose. Um, that wasn't part of the plan. Luckily we are a cheating necromancer who brings her summons to a 1v1. All is fair, as long as I win. Good. It was about time. The gift we get from Baal for becoming his chosen is the spell Power Word Kill. This spell lets you kill an enemy immediately if he has less than 100 hit points. However, you can only use this spell once per campaign. Now, I was just about to leave my temple, but what do we have here? Rebellious slaves? That was a big mistake. No one denies my commands. A simple command. Your tadpole provides the means, your bloodline the message. To end these petty mortals who plague your father. Oh, no more threats? <laughs> I admit, I was hoping for- What did you make Minsk do? Now that's an ending befitting a hero of his stature. A truly heroic end. Now before we go meet Gortash, there is still one fight left for me to do. Which I kinda forgot about if I'm being honest. And that is the fight against Viconia. Mainly due to the fact that the Mirror of Loss barely does anything for us. You are not really gonna feel the difference between 20 and 22 intelligence with this build. Anyway, our strategy will be very similar to the strategy we used against Raphael. It's important that you summon your explosive ghouls on top of the stairs, because if you try to summon anything beneath the stairs, the shards will immediately turn hostile and attack you. Then we turn invisible and try to get as many of them as we can together around them. And then blow them all up. You and I need to speak. Yes, indeed, we need to speak. Why are you still alive? Can we change that? Ah, much better. 
With Viconia dead, this fight is essentially already over. All we have to do is to send our summons in front to tank most of the damage for us and then take them all out using our AoE spells while they are locked in place. Before you want to go to the Mirror of Loss, you should go into the Armory. There you need to pass a perception check to be able to get into Shadowheart's hideout. Inside the hideout you will find a note from Shadowheart. Reading this note will reveal the purpose of the Mirror of Loss to you. A mirror that steals memories. Very Sharon. This way you only have to pass the prayer check to get access to the mirror. I guess we are not getting a memory today. Oh well, we didn't need it anyway. So, whatever. Back at Worm's Rock, we meet up with Gortas, who congratulates us on our successful family reunion. He reveals the location of the Elder Brain to us and suggests we go there immediately to dominate the brain once more. A rather unsuccessful mission, to say the least. Well, at least this will save me the trouble of killing him. Anyway, the Emperor saves us from the Netherbrain and explains to us that the Netherbrain is too strong and only an Elifid is able to surpass its mental defenses. So naturally, we let him assimilate Orpheus so that he opens the path for us to dominate the brain. To get to the brain, I just use invisibility to walk or rather fly past everyone, as I'm just too lazy to deal with this. Before we climb up and face the nether brain, we drink an elixir of battle mage's power and renew the invisibility on ourselves and the emperor. I'm using invisibility here because I simply don't think I would be able to fight my way through all the enemies on top of the nether brain. Not because of the dragon, but because of the Elifid Arcanists. They all have counter spell and high level magic missiles that can easily shred me to nothing. And even with all my summons, this would still be a very risky fight to take. So I just take the easy way out, like a true hero. Before we start to dominate the brain, we drink a flying potion and an elixir of universal resistance to protect ourselves from the netherbrain's attacks. Casting Caster's Compulsion while being invisible will cause it to immediately finish the channeling process on the turn of the Emperor. When fighting the Netherbrain, we need to be a bit careful with our damage selection, since the Netherbrain has the Aegis of the Absolute ability, which essentially is its legendary ability. The Aegis of the Absolute ability allows the Netherbrain to make itself immune to all damage types it took in the round of combat until the start of its next turn. So this means you only want to use one type of damage for every turn, so you never find yourself in a position where you can't damage the Netherbrain. Of course, you can use more damage types per turn if you have a broad variety of damage types at your disposal. But in our case, we only have three main damage types so we need to be a bit careful. The good thing is we only need to deal 350 damage to the netherbrain, since we still haven't used our special power word kill spell. And I mean we have some very powerful spells, so dealing 350 damage should be easy, right? Oh well, all we have to do is to make one additional attack before we can end this. What's the worst that could happen? I don't know what to say. Guess my RNG sheets don't work anymore. Anyway, thanks for watching. I already started my recordings for the Jack of All Trades one. So hopefully for once you don't have to wait another month for the next video. I also plan to do a build guide video for the Necromancer build, which I would like to post next week, so there will be at least two more videos for this month. Hopefully I can do even more than that, 
but I don't want to make any promises that I won't be able to keep. That's all. See you soon. In Ball's name. 